welcome this morning, and um, as the ushers are coming forward, they are going to offer you a outline if you didn't get that, and they'll give you a Bible. While they're doing that, I thought I'd tell a couple of vacation jokes. But I see not everybody's back from vacation, so this might fall on deaf ears. Uh, here's one for you tri Twitter fans. Why did Elon Musk's Tesla take a summer vacation? To recharge his batteries. <laughs> and then this is one for the uh, Panera fans for the after church uh, snacks. Um, what did the loaf of bread do on vacation? It loafed around. <laughs> Last week, um, we had the privilege of hearing Jim preach on Christ's death and burial. And that's where Jim left us. And so today's sermon fits in perfectly because now Christ is risen. And so I'm going to ask you to stand as we read the um, first passage here from 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. And that'll be on the screen there for you. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. You may be seated. He is risen indeed. That's the message. That's the one we sang. Christ is not in the grave. He has risen. And he brings life to us. And I do want to spend just a little time, even though this was maybe not planned, to talk about 1 Corinthians 15 as we lead into today's verse. Because we're sort of jumping in in the middle of Paul's uh, discussion here. So I'm going to read you a, a little section. It starts out in verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to, to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So Paul here talks about the gospel, what it is. The death, the resurrection of Christ, and how that is our good news, the gospel. Um, that first part, I'm calling the importance of the resurrection. Um, Paul goes on. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. So Paul starts by talking about how important is the resurrection for our belief. Well, it's actually a core part of the gospel. If Christ had only died for our sins, then our life would be incomplete. Our future would be uncertain, but it's not. And that's why it's so important to remember the resurrection. The next section in 1 Corinthians talks about what I'm calling the certainty of the resurrection. And I had preached on that before. Um, there, was some, there was somebody teaching apparently in the Corinthian church that maybe there was no resurrection of the dead. And Paul was absolutely livid about that. Um, he says, um, if it, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, he goes on. Our preaching is useless. More than that, we're found to be false witnesses. And if he did not raise him, in fact, the dead are not raised either. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And Christ, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. 
so the certainty of the resurrection is that Paul talks about how Christ appeared to the disciples. He appeared to several hundred people. He appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. We can be certain that Christ has been raised. And that's great comfort. And that is where we are now in entering into the comfort section of 1 Corinthians 15. Christ is the first fruits. There was a sermon, you may have heard it, uh, given by Bruce, July 2nd here. And Bruce talked about his own personal story, how the resurrection, how Christ has changed him. And there's additional proof besides the, uh, the additional witnesses. All of us have a story to tell. We have lives that are changed. We have a life that has been given new life and that is also proof and witness to the resurrection. All right, so finally we come to Christ the first fruits. And when you think of fruits, this is what I think of. A basket of fruits. And this is kind of um, Middle Eastern fruits. There's a pomegranate, there's some grapes. But that is not at all what the first fruits is. So when we, um, the first fruits is not about actually fruit. I don't know how many times I read this and I stumbled over this because I was thinking about fruit that you eat, a basket full of fruit. That's not what the first fruits is. To learn about the first fruits, we have to go back to a little bit of history about Israel, about their feasts that they had. And so I want to look together at um, Leviticus 23, 19, or 9, 11 through 4. And we have a slide for that. Here's Moses describing the festival or the celebration of the first fruits. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain that you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. You must not eat any bread or roasted or new grain until the very first day you bring this offering to your God. This is to be a lasting ordinance for generations to come wherever you live. So this tells us that actually the festival of the first fruits relates to the grain harvest. And that's a little bit different than what we imagine it to be. Um, growing up here in the suburbs, I kind of think bread comes from jewel. But uh, some of you who've had a little farm experience know that's not the case. Um, but it's helpful to go and um, look at um, what really, um, how, how, does, how, do, how does the harvest occur in the times of Israel? And we have a slide, if we could have the next slide, please. This is a, a sickle. Maybe some of you know what this is. It's for cutting down grain. And before the days of International Harvester, when there were combines, which you see out driving through the fields, they do all of this now for us. That's the wonder of the 19th century when we got all this. But before the 19th century, grain was harvested by hand. And you'd have a sickle, and you'd go out, and you'd cut the grain with this. And you can see it's sort of a, a sharp uh, object there. And then you'd take your grain, and we can have the next slide, please. And you'd bundle it up. Now, it didn't always look this pretty. This is Microsoft's version of a sheath, uh, a sheath of, of grain, of barley. Um, so it was a little more stylized, but they would take it, they would, they would take a piece they cut, they'd tie it together, and they'd make these sheaths of grain. And that's what they were instructed to bring to the Lord and offer as a first fruits offering. The first grain to come was barley. 
Wheat came later. That was another offering. But the first fruits was this, this presentation to the Lord, and you would wave it before him and say, okay, this is the first of the fruit, and we're offering it to you. And the Lord said, don't eat that bread from that year until you've done that. This should come first. So what does this tell us? Well, a couple of things. Number one, we all have English Bibles. And even though we read it in English, the first fruits, sometimes we don't exactly understand the meanings. Here's an example where you can read it in an English Bible and not totally get the picture of what's going on there. That's why it's helpful to have resources, to learn other things, to look at other things, to supplement your knowledge. But a translation is great. It just doesn't give you everything you need. Sometimes you need a little extra outside. Um, but what did, the, what did the first fruits mean, and why is that important for Christ? The reason is that this offering of the first fruits had a great significance to the agricultural communities. Not like today, if the harvest is bad, can we import grain from other countries? Can we go to our stores of all of our canned foods and so forth? But these people depended on that harvest for their livelihood, for their well-being, for their very life. So to them, this was hugely important. And the first fruits meant that more was to come. This was the first. The barley was the first part of the harvest. And it promised for them, there's more to come. There is more food coming. There's more wheat. There's other grains. There's grapes. There's pomegranates. There's some of those fruits we saw in the basket before. Those are yet to come. So the significance was this told them that the future crop was coming. And that's why Christ is for us the first fruits. Because his resurrection is that that we can hold on to when things are dark, when things are bleak. Knowing that there is proof. Have you ever asked yourself, have you ever had a night where you thought, what about all the things I believe? Are they ever true? Are they really true? Have you ever doubted your faith? Have you ever said, boy, I have doubts. Many of us have. I know I've had those doubts at times in my life. By the grace of God, those don't always continue at the same level, though. I haven't had those for a while because of God's communion with my spirit. But there were times in my life when I wondered, wow, is this real? Am, I, am I really right? Is this really true? And here is the proof. Here is the proof on the dark nights. Um, if we could have the next slide. This is sort of a, a happy sky. Stars are twinkling. Everything is going well. But the next one is designed to evoke a little different emotion. That's a dark night. That's a night where you feel discouraged where perhaps you've lost family, friends. Perhaps you've lost something with your job, your work, your relationships, and you're hurting. It's a dark night. It's one of those nights that you wake up. No one else is awake. You can't sleep. You pace back and forth. At least in your mind, at least in your bed, you do that. Well, on those nights, you can take hold of the promise of the first fruits. Jesus' resurrection. It's proof. It's a guarantee that our resurrection, that our bodies will be renewed, that they will be raised like Christ's. It's the strength that you need in those dark nights. And that's what the first fruits is all about. And that's the main thing that I want you to take away today is that as you go through life and you might struggle with things, Christ's resurrection is the proof that your resurrection is coming, that the new heaven and the new earth is coming, that there will be a new body that we receive.
Well, the passage doesn't stop there. Paul goes on to talk about, since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now that seems like a fairly obvious thing to us. Um, but it does bear a little bit of thinking about and understanding. Death came through Adam. Uh, Romans 5.12. We should have the next slide, please. Um, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. It's easy to forget that our death is because of sin. It's because of Adam. It's because of what we inherited. Adam is our true father, our true biological head. And what did he bring us? Death. There's no slide on this, so I'm going to read Genesis 2, 16 through 17. We think back about the garden, the entry of sin into the world. Genesis 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Certainly die. Sin brings death. It's easy for us to believe Satan's lies. Oh no, did God really say that? You won't certainly die. But God said, sin brings death. That's not a pleasant message to hear sometimes. But we need to hear it. We need to experience that in our hearts. To understand that. Because I do think it's easy to underestimate sin, to soft pedal it, to think, oh, well, I'm pretty good most of the time. You know, I go to church and I'm active in this and that activity. So what's a little misstep here and there? What's a little sin? Actually, that sin is death. And the sooner we understand that, the healthier we'll be happier we'll be. So I'm going to ask you as I do ask myself, what areas of sin in my life can I work on? How can I counter Satan's sin? The, this, these lies of Satan. Oh, eh, it's just a little thing. It doesn't matter. Is that what the word of God says? Is that what our father, Adam, found out to be true? Not at all. Not at all. This is the line of inheritance that comes through Adam, and it's not a pleasant one. So some of you might look at genealogies. I know my grandfather uh, kind of looked at our genealogy, and he went back and traced our line and found, yes, that indeed we have a Mayflower descendant, John Rogers, who came across on the Mayflower. And so that's something to really kind of hang on to. But we're stuck with the fact that Adam is our father. There is good news, however. Um, if we could have the next slide. We're told that Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in death, or it resulted in condemnation for all people, so one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as the diso through disobedience of one man that many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man many will be made righteous. So in Christ, as Paul says here in 1 Corinthians. In, so in Christ, all will be made alive. Life comes through Christ. Death came through Adam, but life came through Christ.
Does that teach universalism? The belief that all are saved? Well, no, because if you read carefully, and it's important for us to read the verses in context, to read before and after, what does Paul say? He says, For in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. In other words, those who belong to Christ. Paul's here talking about people who are Christians, who are believers, who are followers of God. And this is not in any way to teach that all people are saved. What did Jesus say? Here's one that I also don't have the slide on, so I'm going to read this one. Oh, I'm sorry. Skip that. <laughs> The, 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 the proof is in the text here. All who belong to him, those who belong to Christ, those are the ones that are saved. Now, how does, the, the first question is, well, how does Jesus do that? How does he save us? How can he save us? And to answer that, we're going to look at we're going to look at John 1. Again, there's no slide on this one, so I'll read it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So here we learn that the Word, who is Jesus, is not just a regular man. He is God himself. Only God could live a perfect life and pay for our sin. No human could do that. David didn't do it. Abraham didn't do it. Any of the other famous people in the Bible, they couldn't do it. Noah couldn't do it. Um, who could bring us salvation? Only God. That took a God-man. And then if we skip down to verse 14 in John, we also see... The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So in that verse, we see that the word became flesh. Jesus became human. God became human, joined himself with humanity. So Jesus is fully God, fully human. That's so important for him to pay for our sins to take our place, to be the new head, to be the new replacement for Adam. We're no longer a people that are tied only to Adam. We're tied to Christ. And this is why the early church got so concerned about people who taught inappropriately that either Jesus wasn't a man or he wasn't God. Both of those are essential for our Savior. Both of those are what the scripture tells us is true in John. And both of those are required for him to be our true head, the true head of the church, the true head of God's kingdom. So that answers the question, well, how could Jesus do that? Now the question is, all right, who does he bring life to? And that's answered here again, and I'm repeating and recircling in verses 22 and 23. Christ the first, first fruits, then when he comes, <clears throat> those who belong to him, those that belong to Christ, those are the ones that are brought salvation. Jesus himself tells us that there's two categories of people. And I'm going to read that. Um, we have a slide uh, from John 5, 28 through 29. Jesus said, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. 
So Christ is going to bring life to all people. But there's two categories. Those that have done evil, those that have done good. And the good is being found in Christ. It's not our actions. Our actions are not adequate to satisfy God's demands. And I want to turn and look at Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. We have a slide for that as well. <clears throat> Here, Paul's talking about what it means to be in Christ. You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with, in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Did you catch that? In Christ, that's a hugely important word. And how did you get to be in Christ? You heard the message, the good news, the gospel, and you believed. And when that happened, God marked us with a seal, the Holy Spirit, who comes into your life. So for all who believe, for all who receive, you become part of Christ. You become one who is covered by his blood for your sins. You become one who is cleansed from your wrong activity, and yet you inherit the righteousness, the goodness, the, the right things from Christ. Only he lived a righteous life. Only he lived the good life. And that's available to us by faith, by being included in Christ, not by anything we do. God gives it to us. It's a free gift. So this really comes back to the good news of the gospel. The gospel is good news. We've said that many times. But we want to reinforce that. When we're talking to people about the gospel, we need to let them know, yes, it is, this is really good news. You can be in Christ your sins can be forgiven. You can be joined into God's kingdom and look forward to a resurrection. Let's have the next slide, please. Okay, so I want to put an ad in here for you. This is the website to go to, www.learnaboutthegospel.com. Now, Pastor Jim mentioned that before. We set this up as a video tracked, basically, where you can encourage people to go here. You should review it yourself. If you haven't done that already, I'm going to encourage you to go home, look it up. It's easy to remember, www.learnaboutthegospel.com. You can also ask, ask, uh, access that through our church website. Um, there's a tab on there about the gospel. But it's important, I think, when you're talking to people who don't want to necessarily go to a churchy website, refer them to www. And be sure to include the Ws, because here's what I found. When I did Google, without the Ws, it didn't go there. But when I put the Ws in, it goes there. And here's a little bit of what you're going to see on there. Uh, Pastor Jim, talking about what is the gospel, how do I become a Christian, and what are the next steps? Now, in there is a wonderful tool to share with other people so that they can enter into God's kingdom, so that they can learn about what we're about. So that is, um, that's available. I encourage you to take a look at that. Now, I do want to talk for a few minutes about what the gospel means, how we should be living it. For those of us who've accepted Christ, who've entered into his kingdom, we should, the gospel should be changing us. We should be living lives that are new. And what did Jesus say? He said, well, don't store for yourself treasures in heaven, on, on earth where moth and, rot and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I have to ask myself, and I'm going to ask you to ask yourself too, where is your treasure? Where is your heart? 
our heart and our treasure should be deeply wrapped up in the gospel, in the good news of Christ's salvation, of what he's done in our lives, of how he's changed us. I was going to bring my treasure chest, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> so I wrote down my little treasure envelope, and I've got some of my treasures in here written down. Now, interestingly, as I did this, I realized, you know, your treasures change based on your age. When I was a kid, I had a stuffed toy. And I believe his name was Toiky. He was a rabbit, had a, a plastic head, and my brother had a, a bunny. They used to fight. <laughs> uh, but Toiky was pretty important to me back then. He was one of my treasures. And if you've had a toy that you grew up with through your childhood, a blanket, whatever it is, you may feel similarly. When you're a kid, that's your treasure. And as you grow, those treasures change. Um, one that I want to mention is, um, as a young man, I had to treasure my fiance, who became my wife, who's sitting right here. And then, as life goes on, what happens? Oh, things come along for many of us, homes, children, accomplishments, those become treasures to us. And then as we go through life further, what happens? Some of those things fade, and what do you care about? Your retirement account? <laughs> your family? Your free time? Those become your treasures. But throughout life, as a follower of Christ, our treasure should be the gospel. So ask yourself, where's your treasure? Where's your, what's in your treasure chest today? We can take the next slide, please. So Paul tells us, oh, back up. Um, next slide. Okay, there should be a... Uh, slide from Galatians 5.13. There we go. Okay, I just couldn't see it because of the lights up here. Thank you, guys. What does the scripture tell us? It tells us, brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. Christ has paid for our sins. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And I'm going to suggest to you that that is really the core of living out the gospel, serving other people in love. What example can I give of that? Well, a couple weeks ago, I stopped into Kids Club. And what did I see? Lots of people serving. Lots of people loving those children. All kinds of things went into preparation, and they were done because of love for those children, desire to share Christ with them. Wow, what an example of serving in love. And I know many of you have been part of that, so that's just one example. God calls us in different ways. Some have different gifts, some have different abilities, but serve one another in love. That's the challenge. That will put new treasures into your treasure chest, things that won't rust, that won't corrode that won't stay on earth when you do. Now, a word to those of you who may not have already entered into Christ's kingdom. Don't cling to Adam's death. Death is our inheritance. We get it whether we like it or not. And we have an opportunity. And Jesus said, Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. That's a word of invitation. <clears throat> if you haven't come to Jesus in faith, he's calling out to you now. He's asking you, set aside the things that are in your life, that are your treasures, that you think are so important. Seek him. 
Let him be your savior. Let him be your salvation. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Let's not forget on dark nights, on times when we're hurting, that he has risen. And that resurrection proves to us that he's coming again, that we will rise with him, that we will live with him. And that's an offer that all should take. So, and if you've taken that offer, live and serve humbly.